if you're making a video about something that you're already an expert in, show it to people who are not experts in the field because it's so easy to assume it to to assume knowledge that people just don't have. Um, so yeah, show it to like show it to your neighbor, show it to somebody who's totally unrelated to to what you do. I find that I'm actually much better at making videos sometimes about things that I know nothing about um, rather than stuff that maybe I had studied like really intensely in school. I guess we want to tell you uh, not just how to make a science video but encourage you um, to make your own science videos because really anyone can make one and basically Greg and I have made all of these mistakes so you don't have to. So we, we pretty much just want to share all of the mishaps that we've had. <laughs> yeah, we've had a number of them. Um, to try to make your process a little bit easier. So just can we actually get a, a show of hands for how many people here uh, are currently making science videos or want to be making them for educational videos generally? OK, awesome. That's great. <laughs> Wonderful. So yeah, basically, if, uh, if these two dorks can make science videos. <laughs> Anyone can. <laughs> and I think yeah. Greg's going to start off by talking about um, his, how his pilot episode of What the Physics came to, me, came to Be, which is a pretty interesting story. Cool, yeah. So, um, so this, this idea actually came out of, um, so in the class I teach, we do this little experiment where we put a drop of oil on some water and we measure it to figure out how big a molecule is which isn't that interesting until I read something when I was researching this that Benjamin Franklin would use the same physics to, it was sort of a party trick, he would calm the waves of streams and even the ocean by putting a little bit of oil on them. And it sort of blew my mind that, well first that Benjamin Franklin was such a joker, um, and also that, a, so it was just that he would carry around a small amount just in his cane and he would put it on the water and it somehow calmed all the waves. And I, I literally did not believe it. I said, I need to do this myself. I need to figure out a way to, to try this. Um, and so that was around the time when I was pitching this physics series to Nova called What the Physics. Um, and so I pitched the idea of me trying to recreate this, this experiment of calming the waves of a lake by putting a little oil on the lake, I, I pitched that with a bunch of other pilot episode ideas, and I have to say, people were confused. They like, you're gonna put oil on it? I think Anna was one of the ones who, she, she believed in it, and she, she I, you knew what was, What yeah. can I say? Yeah. I'm a visionary. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that was nice. Um, I, I had so, some support, but most people were, I have to say, confused by it. Um, and also a little concerned because there, as I, I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to put about a tablespoon of olive oil on a lake um, because I calculated that would cover about half an acre of the lake if it spread out to one molecule thick. So I, I really wanted to try this. So the concern, the concerns led me to first reach out to the EPA to make sure that this was fine. <laughs> and so, and it turns out that it, it, it is okay as long as I found a lake if I had a small amount and I found a lake that was sort of isolated and away from rivers and streams so it didn't go into the, the water system. So I now needed to find that kind of lake. Um, and so I basically went through, I talked to all my friends. Um, I, I went you know, through Facebook, scrolled through, do any, who are the, I even sent, I put out, um, you know, my status update on Facebook was, anybody happen to have a lake? <laughs> um, so um, no, no bites there. And then I was railing about how I couldn't, couldn't find a lake to um, somebody who worked at a sandwich shop across the street from me down at Darwin's. Uh, and I, so I, I, I was saying, I can't find this lake. He goes, I, I have a friend who actually owns a lake, but it's, it's unfortunately it's not in Massachusetts. I was like, oh, where is it? And he said, Ohio. And this was the week before Thanksgiving, and I am from Ohio. <laughs> and I was like, tell me more. And so he put me in contact with this friend, and you know, the friend said, you know, that sounds so cool. I'm a scientist too, I'm really interested in this. 
and like the st stars lined up, the planets. It was like it was amazing, and um, and I also had a very attractive film crew lined up back in Ohio, um, my beautiful family. <laughs> And uh, so, so we, we took our Thanksgiving and we, we went out and we bought, you know, we bought a, we bought a drone because we had, we had a, an idea of how we wanted to shoot it. We bought a raft, we bought an anchor, we bought some olive oil. And then we went off on this road trip the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, and we went and we uh, went to the lake and I got onto the lake and I wanted to calm the waves of the lake but there were no waves. There were no ripples, there was no wind. I was getting oil all over myself. We had just gotten the drone and I, you know, my brother and I didn't have much time to, to look at it. He was operating it and crashed it. And then I get a text from the guy who owns the lake that his cat just died and he needs to go home to bury it. And so, so we're leaving and, and we're like, what else could go wrong? The police show up. And so I was glad I checked with the EPA, um, but, but she really was just curious, what are you doing? And so we told her about the experiment and she was, she was, uh, she was like, oh, that's cool. Um, and so it was a, that day was a big disaster. And so as we were leaving, I said, I need to see what the weather's like tomorrow. And I checked the weather and there was a wind to the next day. And so the next day we went and we tried it again. And so here is just a, about a minute of the beginning of this video that, um, that I made about this experiment. Okay, so I just got on the lake and there are a bunch of little tiny ripples from the wind. What I have here is just olive oil. Let's put it in. So it's been a couple minutes and right around the boat, it seems like the oil has calmed all the waves. How could about a tablespoon of olive oil remove the waves from about half an acre of this lake? I'm Greg and what the physics? Well, on the lake, something really strange must have been going on because everything around you, like a pencil or a rock or this creepy primate head is made of trillions of trillions of atoms and molecules, but they're usually all clumped together. But the oil on the lake didn't clump together. Instead, it spread out into a layer that was literally one molecule thick. And the crazy thing is that from looking at this, you can actually figure out how big one molecule is. So that's just the beginning. I go on and I sort of explain some practical applications for glasses and computer screens and other practical jokes. Um, and, and so, um, you know, there, there's a couple of things that I just want, want to uh, remind people who are looking into making videos, which is ask for help. You know, everybody who, who I asked, even if they didn't own a lake, they were really excited to hear about it and they are like, if I had a lake, you could use it. So, you know, ask everybody you know um, and something great, great will happen. Um, and then the other point um, is that, you know, when I first pitched the idea, the people, you know, they didn't completely get it and some people were just, just worried that I was gonna be on a raft on a lake. And so if you think something is gonna be really cool, you should, you should do it. That's, that's, I think, a really good criterion for doing anything, just that I'm really excited about this, even if other people might not be. And I, I think that's a really good point, too, just because on the internet right now, there's so much content, and increasingly more and more educational content. So you need to find something that you're going to be passionate about and allow your own voice to be heard. Um, because if you're just trying to look for an idea that's a crowd pleaser, first of all, Somebody's probably already done it. But second of all, you know, you really want to have your authenticity and your personality shine through. So you better be excited about it. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, oh, here are, here are oh, Greg's truisms. Yeah, that's what I just uh, was just saying. <laughs> um, what Greg probably won't tell you is that that video did extremely well. So that was just Greg's first video for What the Physics. And uh, it has over 2 million views on YouTube and um, tons of views on Facebook too. I think even more than that. So I don't, I ha I've lost count, but it's super, super successful. So we thought we'd sort of talk about 
what made that video so successful. So what do you think made it so successful? Um, well, so part of the reason why I think when I, when I described this to people, they didn't really, they weren't as excited as I was, is I either I didn't do as good a job or I wasn't able to um, do a great job of sort of explaining how the visuals were going to be. You know, we'd have this nice drone shot up and the lake, will, it'll spread out and it'll get smooth. And I sort of, because I had done the experiment myself, I sort of saw, I could see how the oil spread. And, um, and so I, I was imagining some stunning visuals right at the beginning. Um, and I think that was a big thing that drew people in, especially, you know, Facebook, you don't even have the sound uh, often. Right. So having something that's really visually compelling, I think even in the first, you know, five seconds is a really important thing to get the video, um, you know, watched throughout. Yeah, something that um, we often say is don't be afraid to give away your best stuff early in a video or to tease your best stuff early in a video. So whether it's amazing footage or just a, a line that's going, that's teasing like the cool stuff that's to come. It's really important to like pack the first few seconds of a video, especially if it's in the digital space or on the internet, you know, pack the beginning of a video full of, you know, your best stuff, especially because so many people are watching videos like on their phones. They might be online at the grocery store or on the bus and there's someone screaming behind them. There's so many distractions. So you want to make sure that the very beginning of a video, like capture somebody's attention and, and keeps them engaged. Yeah, it should be more exciting than Doritos. Yeah, more exciting than Doritos <laughs> or whatever you're buying. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think that another thing also that, um, that helped a lot is that the, even, so in the video, I actually calculate the size of a molecule based on what you see in the video, which is pretty boring. You don't usually want to calculate stuff in a video um, and get into the nitty gritty like that. But um, having just at the beginning a very simple experiment or simple example that, sort, that gives you an idea of where it's going, I think that's another thing that was really helpful. People could wrap their mind around a tablespoon of olive oil and they know what a, what a lake is and they know, you know, like they could really wrap their head around it. So I felt like that brought them into it. Yeah, I, I agree. So like often what people do who are, who are making educational videos, they'll use a small example to explain a much larger concept. And that's definitely what Greg did. Another thing that I really love that you did in the piece is that um, even though he talks about everything from like Benjamin Franklin to future applications for one molecule thick, you know, substances on technology, like he talks about so much, but there is this one sort of through line going through it. And that's, uh, you know, what can you learn from one, like one layer of, of molecules and how could that be important in our everyday lives, right? So I, I think that what's really helpful often when you're starting to make a video about science is to have a sort of thesis sentence in mind. I do that for almost every video I make. Um, and it's helpful, especially with science topics. I mean, people always say, like, you know, whatever you're writing, it's good to have, you know, your thesis statement. But I try to um, always have, like, one sentence with a noun and an active verb to kind of guide my story. Because with science topics, it can be really easy to, like, start at the Big Bang or start at, you know, the evolution of humanity. Um, <laughs> B to, before you, you know, get into the, the more complex stuff. So I, I think that's really helpful. Yeah, I agree. Um, another thing, oh, here are some, uh, here are some tips. <laughs> um, another thing that I think you did so well was you really made it personal. Like, mm. you're sitting in the boat, you're the sort of tour guide right. for everyone as they sit on the lake. Yeah, thank you, Anna. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> um, Another thing that I think can be really helpful when you're making um, science videos is building characters. Um, so a character can be a person, it can be uh, an animal, it can be an inanimate object. You can make anything into a character. It could be a grain of sand, it could be one of uh, Greg's molecules, it could be anything. So here's an example from one of my videos where I, I sort of build a character to help tell a story. And this is just a short clip from a video on um, wasps that pollinate figs. 
Figs aren't exactly your typical fruits. You can think of them as packages that contain all of the fig tree's flowers within them. But if the flowers are trapped inside the fig, how do they get pollinated? Well, that's where fig wasps come in. In most species, pregnant female fig wasps carrying pollen are attracted to young figs. They enter through a tiny opening at the fig's bottom that's highly selective. It usually only lets in the exact species of wasps that pollinate it. But even the pollinators have a hard time getting in. Most lose their wings and antennae in the process. The wasp's goal is to find a home for her babies. And the perfect home is inside the fig's female flowers. Those are the ones that would produce seeds if they were fertilized. So the mama wasp drops a fertilized egg into as many of the female flowers as she can, sometimes up to a few hundred but she can't get to all of them. Along the way, she winds up fertilizing the rest of the flowers with the fig pollen she's carrying. And those flowers begin developing seeds. Once the wasp is finished laying eggs, she usually dies inside the fig. Goodbye, cruel world. Blech. <laughs> just an example of, you know, having a character in your piece, something like a sort of protagonist that the um, audience can kind of follow. So in this case, it was a mother fig wasp who sadly meets her demise <laughs> fairly soon. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I often get asked, because I do the animations in my, in my videos, and Greg actually does his too a lot of the time. So we're both pretty self-taught when it comes to animation. And people, I think, ask both of us often, like, if you need to have, you know, a background in animation or in video production or, or something like that, or art, to be able to create, um, to create animations. And I will tell you, absolutely not. Um, so I thought I'd give you, like, a little bit of the history of how I, how I became an editor and animator. So when I first got to uh, Nova, I managed to get the job at Nova in the way a lot of people get their jobs, which is um, potentially exaggerating a little bit about <laughs> how much editing and animating experience I actually had. <laughs> and um, all of a sudden, I was supposed to, I started off as a production assistant on the digital team, and I was supposed to be, you know, editing all of these videos, and pe production um, producers were reaching out to me, asking me what sort of codex, video codex, that I, needed to, they, I needed for their pieces, and I just like barely knew how to open Premiere. Like, I, I didn't know anything at the time. It was so embarrassing. And I had just moved to Boston from New York, where I'd left all of these friends behind. And I, uh, my mother actually lives in Boston, and when I first moved in, I was, staying at her house. She wasn't even in town. She was off teaching a class in Europe somewhere. So I was just like sitting alone on her couch watching so much Law & Order SVU. <laughs> just <laughs> feeling a little bit sad and, and depressed about my life and feeling like you know I was never going to be able to uh, live up to what I had promised. But then I realized, you know, I, I, really, I, I really could make this happen. I just needed to practice a little bit more. And I had made videos in the past. They'd just been under, you know, the watchful eye of a professor or an internship coordinator or something like that. I just hadn't had a lot of experience on my own. So I sat on my mother's couch with Law & Order SVU still rolling on the TV. And um, I just started making a little project. And the first project I made was absolutely terrible, but it was just a little, um, video about uh, starting fresh in a new city, in a new place. And because I'm a horrible masochist, <laughs> I'm going to show it to you right now. <laughs> this is awesome. You'll love it. Yeah. It's starting fresh with Anne. Starring Anne. Hi, I'm Anne, and I'm starting fresh. Starting fresh can be fun and easy. Here's how. First, smile. Then, start fresh. Oh, and don't forget to pick up a hobby. I'm Anne, and I've chosen ribbon dancing. See you next time on Startin' Fresh with Anne. <laughs> Oh my god, 
It's awesome. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> So yeah, I, I, I practiced. I just started like doodling little things on the computer and editing, and that's what I came up with. And you know, it's not very good, but it gave me the confidence to know that I could actually do, to do something more than that. Um, so I kept practicing, and what I initially did was I actually would sort of try to imitate other people whose work I admired. And for a while, that kind of made me feel a little bit like a like cheap imitation of the real thing, you know? Um, but I actually one day called one of my old um, mentors, uh, a woman named Flora, whose work is fantastic. I called her up and I was like, listen, Flora, I, you know, I'm doing okay with my job and everything, but I kind of just feel like I'm, I'm copying you. Isn't that terrible? And she was like, oh, no, everyone does that. You always copy other people whose work you know, you admire until you have the confidence to, to do it on your own. So she was like, you'll get there. Everyone does it. And she was right. I did get there. Um, eventually, I sort of had my own tone and my own style figured out. But my biggest challenge really came when uh, I was watching all of these videos and thinking they were super beautiful. And I had this deep, like, existential crisis because I didn't think I'd ever be able to make anything as beautiful as you know, what I was watching. Um, and I hadn't really taken any art classes in years and years and years. And so one day, I went over to my mother's house in tears, and I was telling her how I was never going to make great art. And she was like, have you even tried? And I was like, no. <laughs> and so she was like, come on. And so we went to an art supply store. I bought, you know, watercolors and pencils and some scissors and construction paper and I just started trying and you know now this is what my desk looks like and my first attempts you know like I started small so at first you know I made like a little stop motion animation of a slime mold in a spaceship with a brain I don't know what I was trying to do here <laughs> um, I know it looked okay, so it gave me confidence to try something else. So I made a collage animation, and that one started to look okay. And what I found was not that anything that I made looked perfectly like what I um, hoped it would look like, but all of those little imperfections ended up helping to sort of inform what my style became. Like, it made my, my stuff look like no one else's, you know? Um, and so now I kind of look for those little imperfections, and I, I sort of leaned into them and helped you know, develop the, a style that's inherently mine. So um, a, a while back when Grow Science actually launched, um, my dad called me. And uh, he was like, you know, Anna, you were just, I, I always knew you could write, but you just like weren't such an artistic kid. Here's some of my, my early art, Cinderella, before and after. <laughs> Um, he was like, you know, you just weren't that artistic a kid. <laughs> How did you make such pretty stuff? And I was like, you know, some people could take this as a huge diss from their father, but I'm going to take it as a compliment because I really didn't even have the confidence or knowledge that I could make stuff that looked so nice. Um, so sort of have three truisms here, like to mirror Greg's. One is start with what you know. I started with Anne because I, was, I, I needed to start fresh. So I sat on my mom's couch and started with Anne. Um, imitate until you're no longer imitating. It's totally fine to copy other people as long as it's in service of you know, developing your own tone and style. And then finally, don't fail miserably, fail beautifully, because it's all of those little imperfections that will help you know, come together to create the style, a style that's you know, authentically yours. Um, so that's what I have to say about animating. And if anyone has any questions, please come ask me after. But we wanted to end on a more somber note. <laughs> um, this is really important. I don't yeah. know, Greg. Well, well so basically, um, we do we basically make science videos. And there are a lot of science videos out there. And it's really easy to make a science video that you just, you know, this is what you think is right. And we think it's really important to make sure that you fact check everything. Make sure that you get everything right. Um, because you know, you're, you're doing something for an audience. And you know, online, you know, you, you're building a community. So it's important that you know, these people know that you're, you know, 
you're, you're being honest with them. That's, I think that's really important. Yeah, and they'll let you know if uh, you're wrong, too. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> loudly. <laughs> But also, you know, especially if you're talking, well, if you're talking to anyone, but especially if you're talking to young people, like, you don't want to mislead them. And I'm not saying that you're going to be right all the time, but if you're wrong, cop to it. You know, own up to your mistakes and make a correction, take down the video, whatever. Um, but also do due diligence and, like, talk to scientists, fact check your work, read the primary literature. Don't just base your work on what's already published out there. And also, when you're talking to scientists, I find, I'm sure you find too, that you learn things that you didn't even know were in the story by talking to them. So doing the research actually is like, can open your mind to such cool things. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? So I, I'm a physicist, so I'm, I'm lucky because I can, you know, I'm making videos about physics, so a lot of it, some of it I can fact check. I usually also check with other scientists, but yeah, I have a, I have a physics background. Um, and I have a bachelor's degree in biology um, and worked in a lab for a few years after college, but then I went back and got a master's in science journalism specifically. Um, so I don't have a PhD, um, but I have studied um, about, you know, the scientific method, have worked exclusively in the, in the world of reporting on science stories. Yeah, I was wondering why, why science videos as opposed to some other kind of videos, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. we both just fell in love with science. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's fair to say that Anna's the world's expert on gross science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that's my claim. I, I, yeah. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I usually look for something that, um, like, like this video, that I'm really curious about, that I think that, um, you know, if, if I start thinking about it, I'm like, I want to know the answer to that. You know, I just, I hope that there are people out there that have the same curiosity. So I, I usually just, you know, I'll search around. Like, I'll definitely have periods of time where I'll be searching and looking for ideas, but I'm, I'm usually looking for something that, I don't know the answer to, or I think you know, there's going to be some some interesting answer, and then I'll start just digging into what's already out there because I don't want to do usually don't want to do something that's you know exactly like other things that are out there on the topic, um, but um, but yeah. So the the beginning of my process is just collecting all the interesting things about it, and then I then I pare it down later. So it's like like, oh, there's this cool question, and what's every other cool thing related to it? That's, that's usually how I get started. Um, in terms of finding story ideas, I, I guess there are a few different ways. Um, very often what happens is I'll be researching one story, and I'll call a scientist and, and talk about their work, and they'll be like, oh, wait, you make a show all about gross stuff? You have to talk to this other friend of mine who's working in this lab. You know, like that's, that actually happens quite a lot. Um, also, I mean, humans are just disgusting, and <laughs> <laughs> very often just something gross will happen to me, and I'll be like, what was that? <laughs> and then also, just like I think probably happens to everyone, there are certain days where I'm just like, I feel like I've read the entire internet, and all of a sudden a story idea popped out. Like, I'll just be reading every article on, online and, um, you know. I, I just like stay, stay up on the news a, a, as much as possible. And then certain story ideas will come from that. Usually what will happen is there'll be something sort of topical in the news and I'll, I'll somehow relate, the, relate that to something that's sort of on brand for my channel. Um, I just wanted to, so also one of the best things about being friends with Anna is, you know, when you're having lunch and Anna's like, I just learned this new gross thing. <laughs> Prepare yourself, everyone who's eating. Um, so that's, that's always fun. I feel so bad for everyone at the Nova offices because it, nothing, is, nothing is sacred anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. I, 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 have no, I don't know. I don't know. How do we do 
Oh my gosh, it's so, I, I wish there were like a magic bullet for this. I mean, you have to be, you have to kind of have presences on a bunch of different social media platforms. I, it pains me to say it because like, I'm the worst at using social media, mm -hmm. except for YouTube. Like YouTube's really the only social media platform I love. I also like Instagram, I'm, who am I kidding? But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just not, I'm not great at self-promotion and the people who have huge channels are really, really good at it. Um, but I think doing collaborations with, with other channels that you really like is a great way to get started if you're already producing content. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's a, a big thing. Find a community of, of content creators who you can collaborate with and then sort of like signal boost that way. That's really good. Unfortunately, it's just really, it's, that is the one hard thing about making educational videos in 2017, especially science videos, because there is a lot out there. And so in order to get your stuff seen, I wish that there were just like a button you could click on YouTube that would like boost the signal, but you really need to be like pretty engaged on social media and build those connections with other creators, you know? And like coming to events like this is like a way to sort of start that process, like, you know, if you make a video, maybe Greg or I, I will share it if you like, you know, tweet it at us or something. So that's how you do it. But it, it's hard and it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so one thing that when I, when I was making that video, um, when it first went up, all of the views actually came from this, this I had never heard of it, it was like out, outdoors blog. It was like some blog about like people who like canoeing. Um, I had never heard of it, and I just looked, you can look at you know, the analytics on YouTube, and uh, I saw it was all coming from this one place, and, um, and so I know that a number of people, they, you know, that whatever video it is, they sort of will email somebody who has a blog or you know, somewhere where they know other people go that are interested in that specific thing, and that can give you definitely a boost. And Reddit. And Reddit. Reddit's a big one. Yeah. If, yeah. You, if you understand how Reddit works. Yeah, and, there, and there, are, there are a bunch of small communities on Reddit, so you know, whatever you make a video on, if you can find that community, then they'll, you know, launch it to the top. Yeah. So, I, so yeah, so I mostly use um, After Effects, and I've recently uh, started using Cinema 4D, which is which include basically because that one has a, some physics built into it, um, uh, and one uh, really nice thing about um, After Effects is there's another program that is a plugin called Element 3D that makes After Effects have 3D capabilities. So that's how I actually built the molecules in the video. Um, I just had a, just put this plugin into After Effects and. Uh, built a molecule and then just told, you know, the program, may, now make a thousand molecules. Um, I use After Effects as well, but one thing I, I always want to tell people is that After Effects is a great program, but if there's something that you're using that's like working for you, that's fine. Like, in the end, it doesn't really matter how fancy your software is as long as you know how to use it, you know what I mean? Like if your software is freeware and you use it really well, then that's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that. If you do, you know, uh, many people who do stop motion animation use Dragon Frame, which is a type of software. If you can't afford to buy that program, but you just can be making uh, stop motion animations in your house anyway, like, and you just want to start doing that just with a camera and some sort of basic editing program, like, do that um, because it's all about how good you are at uh, like telling a story and, and bringing it to life. It's the, the animation program might make that slightly easier, but it's not going to be the be all and end all of, of what you can do. And also, you know, there are even great apps for your phone right now to like make stop motion animations. They're not perfect, but you can, you can start today with what you have in your pocket. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I don't make the show 
specifically with girls in mind, except for certain videos that I make because I wish somebody had made that video for me. Like, I made a video last Valentine's Day about periods. Um, it's my little love note to women everywhere, and, and just anyone with a uterus. Um, but, uh, but in general, I'm not making content specifically for women and girls. That being said, I think that just having a female host helps um, with female viewership. So uh, if you look at most science channels on YouTube, it's actually appallingly low how many women, just based on YouTube analytics, which who knows how precise those are, but it's like, like if you have like 20% women, that's like high. And mine is higher than that. I, my split is actually, it hovers around 60, 40, male, female, but sometimes has even swung the other way, um, which is one of the things I'm most proud of. And I wish that I could say that in some ways it was about me thinking about the content and gearing it specifically for women and girls, but I think it's really more just about having a woman that, that people can relate to, that, that women can relate to. And in some ways I kind of like that too, by the way, because, you know, I want my content to be accessible to everyone, and I also want to be a positive role, mo role model for young men. <laughs>I have multiple thoughts about this. I think that if you are making these videos for somebody else, d don't let anyone tell you that they need to be cheap. Um, because yes, they are inherently going to be so much cheaper than uh, you know, film project that has five, a, a crew of five and you're, you're going trooping around like the Amazon or something. You know, if it's you sitting in your office like I do, like at my little desk, like, you know, editing, it, it's just me. So it's obviously gonna be cheaper. But the truth of the matter is like, this takes a long time to do. I try to make a video a week, but that's, I mean, that's a lot of work. That's more than a full-time job. And so I think when you start, when you're starting to pitch a project, you, you need to set your budget higher. However, if, if what you're doing is you're making these videos on your own and you're looking to attract a corporate sponsor, the, the issue with that, with that in science is obviously like, you know, how much brand integration do you really want to have, right? And like, we work in public media, we have very specific guidelines that, that you know, govern what we can and cannot do. Um, there are plenty of channels out there that don't have those and make a ton of money. I mean, you could make, you can make thousands of dollars per video um, if you find the right brand and you want to actually do some sort of product integration. That being said, I personally wouldn't do that, you know. Um, the best route probably is to honestly find like a foundation <laughs> funder who wants to sponsor a bunch of your videos. Um, because then you have like sustained funding for a given period of time, but that's also really hard to come by. It's much more, it's much uh, more common to get somebody who's going to sponsor one video, and then you just need to set the terms of, of how much integration you want there to be. I don't know if I really answered your question, but. No, I think that's, that's great, but I guess maybe the other part too, is especially like your self-funding, these types of projects yeah. for you know, the love of it. So how far do you go, or, or well, I mean, my videos, and if you don't count for the cost of my time, my videos cost like $8, you know, for the most part. It's like, <laughs> like markers and watercolors and like some watercolor paper. Maybe more than $8. Just because I like better watercolor paper now than I did when I started. <laughs> but like, that's it, you know what I mean? So it, it, de it depends. But it's, I would say that it's mostly the cost of your own time. Would you agree? Yeah. Except for like when you're shooting drone footage. Yeah, But Absolutely. that's part of why I learned how to animate because I, I was like, well, am I gonna be able to go on this trip to like film the fish in Hawaii that I wanna film? Probably no. I'm gonna have to figure out a way to tell that story on my own. Yeah. Sorry. I no, 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 it's fine. No, you did, <laughs> that's great. Um, 
Yeah, I think that you're right. Like, you know, there's a lot of um, a lot of stock footage. There are like, you know, there are websites where you can get stock footage. So the first videos that I made were, you know, I I didn't really know how to animate, even animate very well, and um, I didn't have you know the money to go anywhere or even get a nice camera. So what I did was I just found one of those websites that you know emails you and says, just give us a, your credit card, and in a month we won't charge you for a month. You know, and I was like, I'm going to remember to cancel this. I didn't remember, <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> and then. Um, so it, it ended up costing something, but if I were more vigilant, maybe it wouldn't have. Um, but I ended up using a lot, like I think maybe I used like 10 stock videos um, for that first video that I made. And, um, and it, was, it was a lifesaver. There's, re there's really a lot out there that you can get uh, with just stock footage, um, especially when you're first starting out. Yeah. And you don't need an expensive camera also. You know, you can get, oh, yeah. you can get a nice, camera for you know a few hundred bucks now that will you know on YouTube you know people are looking at it on their phone so right I mean and and oh. you also like now so many of us have a 4k camera like in our pockets you know like I think my phone now shoots in 4k so I'm not saying you should use your phone to film stuff probably shouldn't but it, you could if you wanted to also um, if you are going to invest in something I would invest in good audio um, I think that bumps up your production value in a way that ha having perfect footage, if you have perfect footage with crummy audio, it's like way worse than having sort of mediocre footage with great audio. With great audio. I, I think and hope that I will still be making um, media. I don't I actually don't know where that'll go. I mean, a lot of people are moving into augmented reality and virtual reality and 360 video. And so I, I mean, I'm, I, te I teach physics and also um, make these videos. And what, what I hope to do is to sort of bring those two together a little bit. Because there's clearly, like I, when I talk to my students, I'm like, how much of this do you actually learn just from watching YouTube? And it's a huge amount. You know, right? Like, like your lectures, eh? You know, <laughs> YouTube. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so I think that there, at least for me, it seems like there's um, there's sort of a convergence going on between these educational videos on YouTube and education. So, you know, whether whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality, I think I'll probably still be still making some sort of media to. To teach, I I don't I, I don't know, and and also I should say um, I sort of I, I've tried to be okay with not really knowing um, because I was you know I was doing um, doing physics and on that path, and I got so excited about this, but then I had to leave the the physics path in order to do this, um, you know at least you know for a, you know trying to split them is sometimes difficult, so. Um, that's one piece of advice is like what, whatever you're feeling at the moment, you know, don't, don't project too far into the future. That's one piece of advice that um, I would give. Yeah, I, I guess um, I don't know, I, I, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do. I want to be a producer and like Greg, I guess I'm sort of like as people say like platform agnostic. I want to make content that is going to be meaningful and reach people and help people, you know, love education and love science. But is it going to be on YouTube? Is is it going to be gross science? I don't know. Maybe not. But um, you know, it could be something that doesn't even exist yet. Some technology that doesn't even exist yet. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Anne, keeping it f starting, starting fresh, fresh with, with Anne. Anne. <laughs> <laughs> I love that video. <laughs> That's a, no, we've made many awesome videos. I just love that one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, the video, I don't know, the video I made that um, got the most views is one about tonsil stones. 
which are like these disgusting masses of like snot and bacteria and mucus and uh, food that get lodged in your tonsils and sort of like rot there and harden. And then you cough them up and they smell really bad. It's totally disgusting. Um, but, and I don't, I mean, I think so many people have experienced these things and uh, never had an outlet to talk about them before. So like the YouTube or the, the video just became like a weird sort of self-help channel, <laughs> self-help space. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I made a video a few weeks ago um, on uh, this network of fungus that connects um, all of these plants in the forest. And I thought that one was a really good video. It didn't do so great, but I just really liked it. I like that one too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, my, so my most popular one was the one that I showed you. Um, but um, I, and you're gonna have to excuse me for this, for being a little mushy, but I, I am really proud of this video that Anna and I collaborated I on. I love that video too. Um, called 2.5 Ways to Die in a Black Hole. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Anna, that was a great title. That's all Anna. Um, <laughs> And I, I like it because um, this was, uh, you know, a big puzzle in theoretical physics, what happens when you fall into a black hole, like how, how do you die? And it's still, nobody has solved it, it's still a puzzle, but um, it was a really ambitious topic to cover um, because nobody knew the answer. And, um, and also it was nice to learn from Anna during this process because, uh, you know, I, I learned some, you know, animation and things like this. This was when I was just starting at Nova, and so I, I'm very proud of that video. I can I just say also, so so Greg um, wrote the script for the video, and I animated it. it. But but we sort of would talk through the script, and I would be like, I don't understand. Why does this thing need to lose mass? And Greg would be like. It's a paradox, Anna. The entire thing's a paradox. <laughs> I don't know why you think you are going to make sense of it when like physicists have been fighting over this for 80 years. <laughs> We're close. Anna and I got close <laughs> to figuring it out. And we would just sit there and like laugh and just stare at each other like incredulously. Yeah, was... <laughs> but this is why it's so great to collaborate is because, you know, I, there are definitely things that I wouldn't have thought like, oh, you know, this, it seems to make sense. Maybe the mass disappears. But, you know, when you talk to another person, it becomes so much more clear what needs to be explained. I will say, actually, that's a really good point that we should have said earlier. Like, if you're making a video about something that you're already an expert in, show it to people who are not experts in the field, because it's so easy to assume, it, to, to assume knowledge that people just don't have. Um, so yeah, show it, to, like, show it to your neighbor. Show it to somebody who's totally unrelated to, to what you do. I, find that I'm actually much better at making videos sometimes about things that I know nothing about um, rather than stuff that maybe I had studied like really intensely in school. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so the, the person who I'd mentioned before um, who I was imitating was Flora Lichtman. She used to work at um, Science Friday, and she was making their uh, web video series before YouTube was even a thing, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I actually interned with her at Science Friday years ago. And so I would sort of imitate her. But her work now is unbelievably amazing. So she's uh, done a few different series for the New York Times. And she also did a series recently for, and I think is still producing episodes, for this new um, publication called Biographic. Um, you should just, everyone should check out her work. It's amazing. Um, I'm constantly inspired by Vanessa Hill's work from Braincraft. I don't know if you know her channel. Um, but she does stop motion animation, and her work is, is really beautiful. And I've, we sort of started making channels, like she started making hers a little before me. But it's been kind of cool to watch her work progress. And she's like watched how mine's progressed. And so we've really helped each other a lot. There is competition just in the sense that like it's really hard sometimes to not look at people's like subscriber numbers and like feel like you're the worst. <laughs> um, but I don't really feel competition with any of the people I, I mentioned in terms of actually like their, their 
creativity. Like I, I respect what they do and they respect what I do. And I mostly look to them to learn from them, not compete with them. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I was starting my channel, I looked to Grow Science. <laughs> Uh, it was the one Nova YouTube channel, so that was a, a straightforward Thank thing you. to do, and I was glad that I did. Um, and, um, and also, Anna put me in touch with, with Physics Girl, oh, Diana yeah, yeah. from Physics Girl, and um, I actually worked with, with her on a number of videos, and I learned some things from her, and I really like her stuff. Um, you know, um, I, it's, it's true also, Vsauce, I, uh, I look at that sometimes. <laughs> Um, to you know, see how he constructs things. I, I really like how he constructs things. And um, last week tonight, <laughs> something. Uh -huh. I know it's not a YouTube channel, but but there, the, you know, it, it has a format. But then every once in a while, goes out of the box and does you know, like a musical number or like works with like Sesame Street. Yeah. And so you know, um, you know, I, I, I like to try to get you know, inspiration from not just YouTube channels, but since, you know, it's such an open, totally. open world, like, look at whatever shows I'm enjoying at the moment and ask myself, like, what is it about this show that's, like, that's so cool and try to do that on YouTube. All right, well, thank you so much, and I'm for being with us.